<laughs> All right, um, <laughs> enough of that. As we um, continue on, it is good to be back here, and we are continuing. We're continuing our journey through the early life of the Messiah. Um, we've been seeing what it's like growing up Jesus. And for the most part, we've been in the Gospel of Luke. But if you were with us last week, we hopped over to John's Gospel. We were attending a wedding at Cana with Jesus and his mom and some of the disciples. Um, this is the season of Epiphany. And so we're looking at those moments in Christ's life when his divinity was revealed, often for the first time. And so the wedding at Cana was one of those moments. John included that as, his, as Jesus' first miracle, the first public sign to the world that the Messiah had come. It told all who saw and heard that Christ is here, bringing with him a new age of abundance, grace overflowing. And so, well, now we've, we're back into Luke, and we're back into Luke's timeline of the life of Christ. And so today we're going to experience the moment in Luke's gospel that is Jesus' first act of public ministry. And like the wedding at Cana, Luke's story takes place back in Galilee, and in this case, in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. But unlike the wedding, Jesus doesn't perform a miracle as his first act of ministry in Luke. Rather, Jesus does something entirely human and altogether Jewish. Jesus reads scripture in his hometown. You see, I think that's the gift that God has given us by giving us four different gospel accounts of Jesus' life. Because each gospel shares a different story of Jesus, tells Jesus' story a bit differently, emphasizing different aspects of his ministry, helping us see Jesus in a different light, because the ministry and the majesty of our Savior cannot be contained by just one person's story, right? Just one person's perspective on who he is. And so we have this richness of accounts of the life of Christ. And so for Luke, Jesus is, um, Jesus is rooted in the Jewish tradition, and that's essential to understanding his place for Luke and God's unfolding plan, Jesus' place in the Jewish tradition. That's why Luke chooses Jesus' moment of ministry, his first moment of ministry, he chooses to tell the story of Jesus in the synagogue. And this is introducing his public ministry. Luke also emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit in both the gospel and Luke is the writer of Acts, too, where we get the story of Pentecost so you can feel the Holy Spirit is very important to Luke. So as we slide into today's scripture, I thought it would be good to just take a look back and see where Jesus or see what Jesus and the Holy Spirit have been up to. And Jesus and the Spirit have been together from the very beginning of Jesus' life on earth. Because when Mary asks Gabriel, how can a virgin bear a child? The angel tells her that the Holy Spirit will come over her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her and her child will be holy. The Spirit was there from the beginning. When Simeon blessed the infant Jesus at the temple, the Spirit was resting on Simeon as he sang over that baby. And when we heard last, just a couple weeks ago, how the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a what? A dove at his baptism. And then, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but we skipped over the next moment in Jesus' life. This is a moment we typically don't talk to, about until we get to the beginning of the season of Lent. But does anyone remember what the Spirit does with Jesus after his baptism? He sends him out into the into the wilderness, right? That's exactly what we read. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And so today's scripture, again, the Spirit keeps moving in Jesus's life. And so today's scripture begins with the Spirit leading Jesus out of the desert back to Galilee. So this is Luke chapter 4, Verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, there he is again, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. 
And when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we've gathered before you today to hear your word, to hear a word from you. And so by the power of your Holy Spirit, be at work within us today. May the words of our mouth, the med meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I've always been partial to this moment in Jesus' early ministry, coming back to preach in his hometown. Homecomings, I think, are always loaded events. As someone who I, I grew up, I lived in the same town in the same, that's my town, I lived in the same house until I left home after college. Anybody do that? I was 21 when I finally moved out of the house I was born into. My hometown is full of memories, maybe you know this, good and bad, experiences I never want to forget and experiences I just keep hoping everybody will <laughs> forget. It's full of people who affected me deeply for better and sometimes for worse. And my family, actually, my family has roots in this town going back to the very first Cassidy child born in America, worked the railroad and, and married the railroad manager's daughter who lived in Logansport. <laughs> and that's what got us there. So every time I go back, every homecoming is loaded with memories, loaded with emotions, with expe expectations that have been met, often expectations that were missed, <laughs> went unmet. I don't know if anyone has experienced that feeling of returning home after a long absence. Maybe it's back to high school for homecoming. Maybe it's back to college, some of you, for homecoming or your hometown. Or maybe you've returned home after big changes in your life. Sometimes people expect the old you to walk into town, and this is the new you, and you have to do a little bit of explaining. Sometimes our expectations are met. Sometimes they're missed. I still remember the first time I went home again, like Jesus. I'm, I'm not comparing myself, by the way. But I went back to preach in my hometown sanctuary. This is my sanctuary growing up. Like, this was where I was baptized. This was where I'd confessed and been confirmed in the Christian faith. This was the sanctuary where I learned to sing the songs of our faith. I learned to read and to love scripture. And like Jesus, though, I'd gone away. I'd been out in the wilderness for some time. I'd grown up and I had a moment in my life, I've talked to you about it, where I felt the Holy Spirit come upon me. You know, for Jesus, it was out in the wilderness in the Jordan River. For me, it was at someone else's baptism in a hot spring in the urban wilderness of Japan. I found a picture of the place where it was, too. The internet is amazing. But then I came home. Well, I came home to Missouri, and I became a pastor, and the Spirit was upon me, right? I, I, I'm out to preach the good news, and one day the inevitable happened. I went back to my hometown, and I was called upon to preach in that sanctuary. And I remember it was kind of surreal, like some things never changed. Like my mom is still the organist. My great aunt Joanne is still sitting in the back of the row. And, and I kid you not, look at this. 
This was on the internet. That's my great aunt Joanne. That's the back of her head in the same exact spot the back of her head has been in for like a hundred years, literally almost a hundred years. And my mom's at the piano on, on the internet. Some things never <laughs> change. And the choir, they're wearing the same robes. And Mr. Weaver, my high school English teacher, the one who first taught me the power of words, he was still there, sitting in the sanctuary. Only I was nowhere near the person that I was when I left the church. I remember still one of the girls I went to high school with, she was quick to remind me that I was a different person because she came up to me and my family's all there and she said, wow, you talked a lot. <laughs> and I... <laughs> He said, I don't think you ever said that much when we were growing up. And I'm like, uh, thank you? <laughs> Maybe? But I was married now. I was I married well above my station. Y'all are aware of this. I have two beautiful kids, and I've been changed by the Spirit. People asked if I was nervous preaching in my hometown church, and I answered honestly. I said, the thing that made me the most nervous was remembering to say debts instead of trespasses when it came time for the Lord's Prayer. And I got debts, and I still remember I came back here and said debts again. You know, some habits, they come back real easy. It's like riding a bike. And so when I read this story of Jesus and how the Holy Spirit led him back to Nazareth for a homecoming at his synagogue, I wonder what it was like for him. Like, was he nervous? Was he excited? Did the Spirit have to push him a little bit harder to get him back home than it did even maybe to get him out in the wilderness? Like how many of you would rather be out in the wilderness than have to go back home and face the people? Luke tells us that Jesus had been preaching at other synagogues in Galilee before he went to Nazareth. And, and like, was he just putting off going back home? Or was he practicing like he wanted to be real good before he went back home? How many times did did Mary ask him, Jesus, when are you going to come home to preach? My friends want to see you all grown up and preaching before the final spirit finally got a hold of him, like my mom was, got a hold of me <laughs> and drug me home to preach. That's where the similarities end, by the way, because unlike me, we read in Luke, Jesus was praised by everyone for his preaching. <laughs> and so here he is. Fresh out the water, straight out the wilderness, going back to Nazareth. Luke tells us where Jesus grew up. And like the devout Jew that he was, Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his what? Custom. Jesus didn't miss church. Interestingly, Luke's account is actually one of the few descriptions we have in the world of what went on in synagogues in the first century. We know that, especially in a small town like Nazareth, synagogues served as community centers, as schools, and it's still, um, synagogues are still called shul by some Jews today after the German school. They served as courts and of the hub of religious life. And on the Sabbath day, probably this Sabbath day, Jewish men and women would have gathered. The service would have started with a reading of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, it's on the wall right over there. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Prayers would follow. Then a reading from the Torah, the law, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. And then Jesus stands up. We don't know if Jesus was maybe planning this moment all along, like he knew he was going to preach that day, or did they see the good, the good kid come home, right? Had they heard he'd been preaching and teaching around Galilee? Had they heard the good reports, and when they saw their hometown boy walk in, the carpenter's son, when it came time to read the second scroll, the complimentary reading from the prophets, did they all look to Jesus, ask him to read and to teach. And so there he is. He's standing before them. And I wonder if Jesus looked out, did he see his mom in the room? Like her eyes gleaming? His brothers, like a little unsure what Jesus was about to do? This young man they knew so well, but who looked so different? 
now? Did Jesus look out and see friends there, neighbors? Did he see his great aunt Joanne still sitting in the same place, in the same back corner, the same head back there bobbling up and down? Did he see his old rabbi, the one who taught him the power of the word? And so when he unrolled the scroll, I wonder, like, had he already read, uh, planned to read Isaiah 61? Like, did he come out of the wilderness with those words on his heart? Isaiah's words to the Israelites after they just returned from exile in the wilderness of Babylon. And did anyone notice when Jesus like slyly throws in a word, a phrase from Isaiah 58, right in the middle of Isaiah 61, like maybe he had a nod or a wink to his old rabbi, like, I know what I did. And then he started speaking. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he read, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Just two short verses from Isaiah 61. Two short verses that were a reminder to the Israelites that like the wine from the wedding at Cana, the best was yet to come. Because you see, the Israelites, they had come back to Jerusalem from Babylon, a homecoming for them, right? Expecting everything to be better, expecting the promised land, expecting that they wouldn't just be called the chosen people, but they would feel like the chosen people again. But instead, those expectations weren't met <laughs> at their homecoming. They came home to burned out homes, broke down walls, ruins of a temple, the streets overrun of Jerusalem by foreigners, infighting. And though they were home, Persia was still in charge. This was not the homecoming the Israelites expected. Homecomings are hard. They very rarely live up to expectations. And so Isaiah spoke a word of hope. The best is yet to come. You haven't even tasted the best wine yet, Israelites. There is good news yet to come for the poor among you. The captives, basically all of you, will be free one day. The blind will see, and the year of jubilee will come, Isaiah says. Now, if you don't know, the year of jubilee, that's from Leviticus 25. I've always wondered if that was the Torah reading for that day when Jesus was in the synagogue. Because in Leviticus, the Lord commands that the Israelites observe a year of Jubilee every 49 years, seven times seven. It was a year when Jews would return to their family land their homeland, lands were to be returned to their original owner. Like if you had to sell your land to make ends meet, it came back to you in 49, every 49 years. Israelites who had become indentured servants to other Israelites to pay off their debts were set free in the year of Jubilee. And liberty, God says, is to be proclaimed to all people. To be honest, we don't know how many times, if at all, the Israelites actually practiced jubilee. Sometimes the most freeing, sometimes the most liberating things in Scripture are the things we do the last. We hold off on, all of us, right? But we do know that by Jesus' day, the Jews saw the year of jubilee not as something for the then and now, right? For the here and now, for them to do they rather, they saw it as a reminder of what the Messiah, Israel's Savior, would bring one day. And so Jesus returns to his hometown, his land, to read from Isaiah, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of Jubilee is now. And then silence. All eyes are upon him. You know, it was customary, by the way, to stand and read Scripture and then to sit, to teach like Wanda, and like Kim, like Dina, I got you, and Laura sit to teach our children. And Jesus unrolled the scroll, rolled up the scroll. 
He gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. I gotta imagine they're wondering, like, what's this guy gonna say? They're like, how do you follow that? How long is he gonna talk? He's been teaching up a storm all through Galilee. And when he finally opens his mouth, he doesn't even say ten words, just nine. That's it. You know the first word he says is? It's a beautiful word. Today. Today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Talk about that as like Jesus' mic drop moment, right? <laughs> like, poof, enough said. Today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The year of Jubilee today. The Messiah has come today. There is good news for the poor. When? Today. Good news for the poor in spirit, the poor of heart, the poor of health, and the poor of, of bank account. Good news for the poor. When? Today. Good news for those who are held captive, captive to fear, to addiction, to hurt, to mental illness, to those who are held captive in a country that has just 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's captives, prisoners, released to the captives. When? Today. Recovery of sight to those who are blind to grace, blind to love, blind to hope, and quite literally blind. Recovery of sight to the blind. When? Today. Recovery of, for the oppressed. They shall go free. The oppressed by, the, uh, by broken systems, by a broken government, by broken homes, by broken hearts, oppressed by broken people. The oppressed shall go free. When? Today. Today, did you hear that? Can you imagine the people in the synagogue that day? Neighbors, friends, family, rabbis, Jews, Israelites who had been waiting 500 years since they came out of the wilderness of Babylon and back to Jerusalem. Israelites that had been waiting 500 years for Isaiah's words to be fulfilled. And then their hometown boy Jesus walks in and says that day is when? Today. Can you imagine Mary's mom, or Jesus' mom, Mary, like hearing those words and thinking of that maybe painful moment when Jesus said to her, Woman, why does this concern me? My hour has not yet, what? Come. Can you imagine Jesus' mom, Mary, realizing, Oh, the wedding wasn't that hour. <laughs> Jesus' hour is when? Today. But the beauty of Jesus' words are that every time we hear these words proclaimed, Jesus' hour is today. It's always been today. Ever since that moment in the synagogue, Isaiah 61 is being fulfilled. When? Today. Every today. When the Spirit came upon Peter and he preached his first sermon on Pentecost, that day was today. When the Spirit came upon Constantine and he converted an entire empire to Christianity, that day was today. When the Spirit brought Julian of Norwich visions of divine love in the midst of a black plague, that day was today. When the Spirit left John Wesley feeling strangely warmed outside Aldersgate, that day was today. And when the Spirit led Martin Luther King Jr. to preach this same scripture from Luke 4, that day was today. And so today, we've all come home to this sanctuary to this holy ground, to this place of community, the center of our religious life. And wherever you have experienced poverty in your life, there is good news for you in Christ Jesus today. Whatever in your life holds you captive, Jesus has come to release you when? 
Today, whatever makes you blind to the things that you love, the things that you need, Jesus has come to make you see. When? Today, whatever you experience, oppression, whatever has knocked you down, kicked you down, kept you down, Jesus is here to pick you up. Jesus is here to set you free. When? Today, for this day, today is the year of the Lord's favor. The Holy Spirit has anointed our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the year of Jubilee begins when? Today, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to try this. Can we try this? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to sing whatever key you're in, I'll tell you that. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Amen. Will you keep playing that? Just keep going. I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> when you feel the Spirit upon you. <laughs> I want to invite, I got to do this. I want to invite us today. Today. If you feel called, she's going to be playing if you feel called to sing, you can sing. If you feel called to come down, I got two of our care team members. They're going to come down with me. We'd like to anoint you with oil if you feel called today. That you might remember that the Spirit is upon you. That after Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came down upon everyone, the Spirit comes down upon you, inviting you, calling you, proclaim good news, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. So I'd like to invite our care team members, Mary and Janie, to come down. I'm going to bless. Lord, oh God, thank you for the reminder of your son that when he went home, you came home to him in the power of the Spirit as his mission was revealed to all those around him, you revealed your mission to us. And to pour out your Holy Spirit on this oil today, that all those who come to you, who feel called to you, who feel pulled by your Spirit to stand up, to be anointed by you, may we have the strength to share your good news to a world that needs it. May we have the strength to declare that this day, begins a year of the Lord's favor. In your name we pray, amen.